Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> it's an exciting day today. I was in my office today. Uh, our, the brushstroke offices uh, are right next to a fraternity house. My office faces the front road, but it also uh, has a side window on the end of the building that uh, is open to the parking lot and I can see right next door to the frat house. And today, as I was in my office, um, after the Easter break, some of the guys came back and I was watching one young man with his dad and they were unloading laundry basket of clothes because that's what you do at break. You take your clothes home and have mom wash them. Uh, been there, <laughs> done that. And I, I wasn't really mindful of them. I wasn't staring at them or gawking. I was just could see them out of my peripheral vision. And I saw them make a final trip into the into the frat house, and we have a great relationship with these young men. Uh, they, we allow them to use our parking lot when they have something going on, and or just even through the day. And they take care of us. If I need something, I can holler over and ask them to come, you know, carry something or do something. Uh, they invite us over for Thanksgiving meal every year. Uh, they make uh, the old ladies of our ministry a full spread of Thanksgiving meal. We feed them during their exam week. We we have them come over to our building and we feed them with subs and hoagies and snacks so that they have something to eat during their exam week. Um, anyway, I was watching this one young man and he went to hug his dad and I, I didn't time it, but the hug was so long. They just stood there in the middle of my parking lot just hugging one another. They weren't, you know, crying or tearing up or anything. Uh, the dad was the dad was facing me, so I could see his face, and he just had a grin on his face. But it was a very long embrace, longer than normally you would see a young man and his father, you know, do uh, 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 publicly anywhere. And it just got me thinking. It just kind of went through my spirit. What a, in fact, I said out loud, what a sweet moment that was to see that. But I wonder if that's how we don't treat Jesus sometimes. We don't want to hug him publicly. We don't want to embrace him very long because we might be judged for, the, for embracing Christianity or embracing the Bible. And so we sort of maybe just give him a quick hug or give the Bible a quick little notation uh, and then we're on our way. You know, we, we maybe go to church, but we don't want to get involved. We, we don't want to be, you know, publicly um, displaying our, def our affection for Jesus. That's what, th that's what went through me. And so I'm just here to encourage you, you know, be like that young man and his dad. They were unashamed of the love they have for one another. And this lingering embrace is something that I will keep in me for a very long time. And I just want to be encouraging to you. It's okay for public displays of affection toward your Savior, toward your Lord, toward other believers, toward church and the Bible and the things of God. So often we get ridiculed and so we shy back from them. But today, I want to be that young man. I want to boldly declare my love for my Savior. And I want to publicly show my affection for my father. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, we have just come through this great Easter celebration, the Resurrection Sunday of our Lord. We're a couple weeks out from it now. But the power and the effects still linger. If you heard my show last week, you, what good is resurrection power? It is still good today. If you've not seen that show, you can find every show, every TV show on our website, breaststrokeministries.com. Uh, go to the video page and every TV show is listed. It's there. Watch it. Uh, you can find us on YouTube channel. Uh, we have our, uh, uh, we're on a YouTube channel. Just type in Jenny Fister or one breaststroke at a time and all the TV shows will pop up. Well, I have a message again this week, a little bit different, well, a lot different, called Unchained Melody. That song is a really popular song, you know, oh my love, that one, right, okay, Unchained Melody, uh, done by the Righteous Brothers. Um, I, I looked it up. So it was a 1955 song uh, written by 
couple of guys, um, and the music was from a little-known movie, a prison film uh, from 1955 called Unchained, hence the song title. Um, the Righteous Brothers made it famous, but I, again, looking up the facts, there are over 1,500 recordings of Unchained Melody uh, been made by over 60, 670 artists in multiple languages. Unchained melody. Like there's a melody about being unchained or chained. And I, I heard this song and it clicked off in me that I don't always feel unchained. I often, not so much now, but through my years, have often felt fettered or chained or bound. And I'm not alone. I have friends that are still suffering with things that have bound them um, from something in their past. I hear it all the time in ministry that they feel chained to something. You know, I never thought I would know what it would be to be enslaved to anything, but we are slaves to a lot of things in our lives. We're, in, we're slaves to being well-liked. We are slaves to temptation. Some of us are slaves to being someone that we're not. We've put on this, this air of something, and we're chained to that thing now. Many are chained to alcohol. Uh, many are slaves to drugs. Many are slaves to certain foods. You know, where they're, they're sugar addicts or carbohydrate addicts. Um, they're, they're enslaved to um, fame. They're enslaved to making money. And they're chained to it. And this is not why Jesus came. He, he didn't come for us to still be in bondages to things. He came that we might be free. Now, many of us, you know, we were, we're chained to something. And just as we're ready to taste the sweet freedom of being unfettered to that thing, Mm, something happens and we become chained right back to it and it sort of slips out of our hands well what is freedom in Christ when we just celebrated Easter resurrection and we say Jesus has set us free we, you know we're, we're no longer enslaved we're, we, Jesus has come and we're free well, what does that mean to be free. What does that mean to be uh, not enslaved to anything? Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 2 very clearly tells us this. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what does that mean? Well, here's what, it, here's what that means. Though I still sin, it doesn't have power over me. In other words, Jesus has made me free from the power of sin, and I now have the power to say no to sin. It also says that I'm free from death. I will never taste death as a believer. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from Satan, and I no longer will die. Now, I will die a physical death, but I will, no, I will never die a spiritual death. You see, when I blink my eye, when, the moment I, God withholds my last breath, in the twinkling of an eye, I'm going to be with him. I just go from this life to that life, of this side of eternity to that side of eternity, because Jesus paid the price and freed me from being bound and enslaved to the fear and the penalty of death. Praise God. But does that help me here now? I mean, it gives me hope for when I die, right? It gives me hope as I live that sin doesn't have the same power. Well, Isaiah prophesied 700 years before Jesus. And when he, he gave us a glimpse of what Jesus' ministry was going to be. And in this glimpse of Jesus' ministry from Isaiah, I, I want us to have our eyes opened to what this really means for us. Now, I'm going to read it in the message. It's Isaiah 61, verse 1. 
it's just, I, I love the, the way that the message lays this verse out. The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me. This is the prophecy that Isaiah is putting out seven years, 700 years before Jesus. Jesus will come later and proclaim this verse as he's reading it in the temple. And this is what it says. This is what Jesus is saying. This is why Jesus is coming. The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God has anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the heartbroken, and to announce freedom to all captives and to pardon all prisoners. Freedom to all captives. I've never been in jail. I've never been a captive. I've never been kidnapped. I've never been held against my will. And so there has to be a different meaning about captive. Well, of course there is. He's not talking about just physical captivity. He's talking about something that has a power over us that holds us captive. I listed some things, drugs, alcohol, being like temptation, food, fame. There are things in our lives that hold us captive. They, they, they keep our attentions away from God. They keep our focus on it and not on God. And Jesus said, I have come to free you from the things that hold you captive on this earth. When we trust him as Savior, those chains that keep us from a joy-filled, victorious life are broken. We have been liberated. We have been liberated from the lies that have programmed our minds to believe that we will never overcome whatever it is that's holding us captive and keeping us bound down. We'll begin to see things from God's point of view that we've never seen before. This is John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, that's a big word, who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, the word know here. The truth that you know, you shall know the truth, is one of my favorite words in Greek. It's gnosko. And it means to experience the truth. If I told you it was raining and you looked out the window and you saw the rain, you would calculate in your mind that it was raining. That's, you would have a knowledge of the rain. That's not gnosko. Gnosko is, I tell you it's raining, and you run outside and you get drenched with rain. That's gnosko. You've experienced the rain, and then you know. You have an experiential knowledge of rain. This is this word. You shall experience the truth, and the truth that you've experienced is what sets you free. In other words, when you allow God to set you free from one thing, you've experienced the truth. And then that truth will help you experience another truth. It may, I know people who are enslaved to a tongue. I mean, every word out of their mouth is a foul word. It's a cuss word. And they can't even speak a whole sentence without using something bleeping in the middle of it. But if they could be delivered from that and experience that deliverance, how much more will they experience other deliverances from things that hold them captive? You see, this is what Jesus is saying. He's not just a, you know, just, okay, you're free. Okay, you're free. Okay, you're free. Savior. He's a follow me. Abide in me. Abide in my word. Be with me, believe in me, and you will experience things in your life that you can hardly believe you'll experience. That's what Jesus is saying. You see, true freedom isn't about, you know, what country you live in or, or what activities you are or aren't allowed to participate in. True freedom comes from knowing that Jesus died to give you the power 
to be free. You don't have to be enslaved to anything on this earth. It comes from knowing the truth about ourselves and about Jesus. You see, Jesus just paid the price for our freedom. He came to earth to set you free. That's what was prophesied back in Isaiah. I've come to set the captives free. All my life, I was a captive to lying. I was the best liar. I was almost pathological about lying. I would lie. If, if, if it were blue, I would lie and tell you that it was purple, just to lie to tell you it was purple. But God delivered me from that, and I've experienced the freedom of the truth in a literal and um, figurative way. I know the truth, <laughs> and the truth that I know, gnosko, experienced, has set me free. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. This is Paul, and Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the freedom or the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not again be entangled with a yoke of bondage. You see, once Jesus sets you free, you are free. And you don't have to be enslaved to whatever it is that holds you down. It might be something in your past. You may have been molested. You may have been physically abused. And it, 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 it holds you. It has a, 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 a binding effect on you. Jesus, he came to release that for you. You may have had terrible parents. Jesus came to release that for you. You may have had a tremendously wonderful upbringing, but you still feel empty. Jesus came to release you from that emptiness. No matter what side of the spectrum you've come from, no matter what is holding you bound, keeping you bound, Jesus came to set you free. John 8, 36 says this, Therefore, oh, love the word therefore in the Bible, because in the Bible, if it's a, there's a therefore, read right before the therefore, and that's almost as powerful as what comes after the therefore, because you have to ask yourself, what's the therefore there for? Here's what he said. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, the word free here means to liberate and to be unrestrained. Can you imagine what it would feel like to be unrestrained when it comes to something that has kept you enslaved, like drugs or alcohol or food or your family or your job or, or something that's happened in your past or fear of the future? Those things. I know people who won't move because they're so fearful of what their, their choice might become. Jesus came to release you from that. He came to set you free from fear. He came to set you free. And once you have been freed, you are free indeed. To be unrestrained, to take the deepest breath you can imagine. That is unrestrained. Now, it doesn't just mean that, that you're free from sicknesses or diseases, but absolute freedom from accusations or condemnations that the enemy may be hurling against you. It means you can live free from your past and free from our fears of the future. We are free from chains that bind us and free to live in abundance as he has promised he has promised not just life, freedom, unrestrained liberty, but he's promised life abundant beyond that. How does he do that? <laughs> Through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. This is how Jesus makes you free. Let me show you this verse. This is Paul again. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord 
is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's liberty. I attended a church for a very long time here in my hometown called Liberty in Christ. And that's how we tried to live, by this verse. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. In other words, I, I can't have liberty outside of Jesus. I can't experience freedom simply through a 12-step program. They're good, but you're never totally free. Only Jesus can totally set people free. And when he does, remember Isaiah 61, that's 2,700 years ago, Isaiah said he's coming to set the captives free. Jesus comes 2,000 years ago, walks into a temple, and declares, I have come to set people free. Not just from sin and death, but from anything that chains them, that binds them, anything that holds them down. I've come to release them. I have the key. Medications can't free you. Doctors, family members, more of something can't free you. Only Jesus can set you totally free. And where the Spirit lives, there's freedom. And He lives inside of us. The power of freedom lives in Jenny Pfister. I will never understand how a holy God can live inside this temple. <laughs> because I know my thoughts sometimes, I know my actions, and they're far from holy. Yet He chose to set me free by living inside of me. And little by little through my whole life, he has set me free from things like being rejected. He set me free uh, from things like acceptance in my family, which I used to bother me, used to break my heart. But he set me free from the expectation of being loved by everybody. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And God is calling his people to live in freedom. Jesus died and rose again for us to live in this freedom. Now, the enemy has a job. The enemy's job is to strap us down, to keep us bound in the things that we think are unbreakable. But Jesus gave us a job to live in the freedom because he has broken every chain. I remember seeing on Facebook, I, I wish I could come up with a video. It was a little three-year-old girl who was listening to the song in her church and they, her mom was recording her. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain in only a way a three-year-old can speak it. But she was stomping her foot Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. That's what the Spirit of God does. He comes to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And that little girl had more truth in her than a lot of adults I've come up against. Oh, we have our reasons for being bound. Oh, this is something too big for Jesus. I'll never get over this. Or, um, no, the word just isn't powerful enough. Huh. Sometimes you just want to sort of grab people and shake them a little bit and say, do you not know the love of God and the immense power that lives within you? Like Jesus said, he told the Jews who believe, if you, if you are with me, if you are in me and I'm in you, You'll know all the truth you need to know to set you free from everything on this earth. And that's our job. See, the enemy has a job to keep us strapped down, bound, fettered, and chained. 
But we have a job also to counteract the enemy's traps and to destroy his work. We stand on the word of God. We stand on the power. We believe we're truly free. We walk in that freedom. We don't have to just sit down and take the torment of the enemy. We are free and we are free indeed. We need to shake off the chains, lift up our hands, shake off the chains, lift up our hands in freedom, and worship the Lord. That, my friends, is the real unchained melody. When you can release, be released from the chains, shake off the shackles, lift your hands in praise and worship, bow down before God, and sing the unchained melody. Chris Tomlin did it this way. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. See, that's the unchained melody. That's the unchained melody. It's amazing grace. My chains are gone. I have been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And his mercy reigns. Oh, amazing grace is the real unchained melody. And I want you to be able to sing the real unchained melody. If you don't know Jesus or you are shackled to something, call us, get online, drop us a note. We want to lead you to the chain breaker, to the one who died for your freedom, for the one who unshackles you with the key that only he has. He loves you. And he wants to paint a beautiful picture of your freedom in his power, one brush stroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brush Stroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 260. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brush stroke at a time.